Welcome to the talk on CRISPR-Cas9. As you know, uh, the invention of this uh, reagent has revolutionized how genome editing is done, how biology will be done in the next decade. Before I actually go into my real talk, let me show you a short video on how this particular reagent works. Uh, the video is going to explain uh, the molecular mechanisms of this reagent. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. So now that you've seen the video, you know everything about CRISPR-Cas9 that I do. However, uh, let me give you a brief outline of what it does rather than how it does it. And then I will go into the details of the various um, exciting things that one can do with this reagent. First of all, as you already understand, it's a tool to make targeted gene editing possible. And it's a very simple reagent. If you want to edit a gene, all you need nowadays is just the sequence of the DNA of the target gene. 
And if you know the sequence, you can use a little computer program to design uh, two bits of RNA uh, called guide RNA, and you can get a company to make it for you for $30 or less. You also need a little enzyme called Cas9, or its gene that makes the enzyme. Uh, the gene is freely available, or you can buy the enzyme for about $100 a piece. Then you take your cell of interest into which you introduce your guide RNA pairs and the enzyme's gene. And the guide RNA pairs and the enzyme will do its marvel and edit the gene. When the DNA breaks by the action of the Cas9 enzyme, editing occurs as the break repairs. So this is all that you need to understand how the reagent works. But of course, there, is, there are a lot of much more interesting issues, and that's the substance of the rest of the talk. So, this as a cartoon, uh, what it looks like, the Cas9 enzyme is this blue ball, and this is your target DNA, which is acted upon by the guide RNA, and the enzyme has two active sites, and we'll talk more about these two active sites later, and it cuts the two different DNA strands. Uh, which is problematic. Enzymatically, it's very hard to cut two different DNA strands. But the question is, what can you do with it? So we'll uh, take a look at a few reasons why you want to do this. So one a group of reasons could be to discover you know, which and hows of sciences. And for example, which genes are responsible for a particular disease, as you heard in the, in the video, how do they work? Uh, which genes may be important for adverse drug reactions? And can you bypass uh, such genes somehow? And the other things could be among the engineers uh, among you uh, who are more interested in doing something rather than knowing something, which is what the first one is, is why and how? Why do you want to do it? Suppose you want to cure a disease due to retroviral infection, and the retrovirus has integrated into the genome and is going to come out anytime. Or how to eliminate an infectious disease for which no vaccine actually exists. So let's take the first example to discover. Uh, so there is a large group of breast cancers, invasive lobular uh, breast carcinoma, or uh, ILC, which um, inflicts uh, some 8 to 14 percent of all the breast cancer patients in America, and it's a very, very large number. And what happens is the epithelial cells and the tubular lining uh, of, of the ducts inside the breast these cells become non-adhesive and come out from the epithelium and infiltrates and becomes metastatic and go everywhere. And those of you who had taken ALS 300 uh, just a few uh, weeks ago know that there is something called e cadherin gene, uh, which makes a protein that um, uh, works like an intracellular, intercellular communication agent and, and then signals the surrounding cells, telling them to stay put or do something else. And what happens is that uh, mutations in various genes, including the e-cadherin gene, uh, have been found in such ILC patients, and e-cadherin uh, functional protein is not produced in many of these, uh, most of the cases of the ILCs. And as a result, and you already know this, something called epithelial mesenchymal transition occurs in which the normal epithelial cells become uh, cancer stem cell-like and go, very, go to various places and produce cancers. So this is all old story for you guys. Now, as it happens, people took ILC patients' tumors and, and deep sequenced them, trying to find out how many other mutations uh, exist in these tumors um, samples. And as you go up the stages, grade one, grade two, grade three, it seems that the, the number of other mutations that you can't, um, you know, you have no idea what these are doing, but lots and lots of mutations, they actually keep increasing somewhat, and sometimes there are more than a thousand different mutations. And these are various uh, kinds of ILCs that have been graded on the basis of what people thought that the original mutation might have resulted into the cancer. And many of these have thousands of mutations. This is a log scale. Thousands of other mutations sprinkled anywhere in the genome. And you couldn't know it uh, just uh, six years ago because there was no technique for, for finding these out. There was no deep sequencing technique at that time. 
So there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of other mutations. But the question is, are they driver mutations which di directly cause cancer? Or are they simply passenger mutations? They do not affect the cancerous outcome, just happen to be there, random uh, mutations. So how would you find out? And so you go to a transgenic mouse model, and the model has a version of the e cadherin gene, and I don't want to go into the detail now, uh, a, a mutant form uh, which causes breast cancer. And also, this particular transgenic mouse is induced to make Cas9 protein in its breast epithelial cells. And just this e cadherin mutation does not itself lead to cancer. So it's looking for something else in addition. And you know already cancer is hardly ever, except cancers of the connective tissues, such as um, blood vascular system, cancers are almost always the result of multiple mutations. So e cadherin mutation is not itself sufficient, but it is necessary for this kind, this version of cancer called ILC. So what you do is take lentiviruses, which are retroviruses that have the ability to take, to be engineered with any gene of your interest, and then infect the breast epithelial cells and they go and insert the, the genes onto the genome. And you can uh, put uh, guide RNA in these retroviruses against any mouse gene that you want, a simple piece of RNA. And you have one virus containing guide RNA against one gene, a second virus containing a guide RNA in a second gene, and so on for all about 20, uh, 23,000 genes. And you have this collection of viruses, lentiviruses, and you inject those into the breast epithelium of, of, of breast tissues of the mouse, and you get cancers, you get tumors, and then you do deep sequence to find out which genes have been mutated by the action of Cas9 on the basis of the guide RNA of certain genes. And then you can find out, because the tumors, the tumorous cells are going to survive more, are going to proliferate uh, in proportion more than other, other cells. So you can simply take those tumor cell sequence and find out what has been mutated, and then you know. So this is an example of a complex gene, uh, complex genetic um, process that can be simplified by the use of the Cas9 CRISPR system. A second example. Discover which genes are important for cancer drug resistance. And here we take the example of non-small cell lung cancer, which afflicts some 85% of all uh, lung cancers. And there are lots of people in America. This is the largest, uh, uh, the, the, the most frequent kind of cancer in the world. And only 10 to 15% uh, response rate uh, have been found for this kind of patient to any targeted anti-cancer dr drugs. And you already know what targeted anti-cancer drugs are. Those that target specific molecular mechanisms that may have given rise to those cancers. However, the patients return with resistance to the targeted drug in a very short time. So how do you find out what are the genes that are responsible for evolution of the cancer drug resistance? So there's a conventional paradigm in which you take the drug resistant cancer cells uh, upon selection and then try to find out what has gone wrong by doing all kinds of tricks. But usually there are hundreds, maybe sometimes thousands of gene muta mutations in there. So how do you know, how do you deconstruct and understand the actual mo molecular mechanism by which these cancer cells have become drug resistant? And that's a tough process. There is a novel paradigm that we had suggested and, and we are now um, pursuing in our laboratory in which you take the cancer cells and then using CRISPR-Cas9 make genetic changes in these cancer cells and select for drug resistance, phenotype. Whatever comes out, you sequence and find out which genes have been changed and you know the molecular pathways. So this, uh, basically the, follows the logic. Does X gene impart resistance to the cancer cells to a specific drug? So you challenge the, uh, the lung cancer cells with that drug. If X does not, then the cell dies. If X does, then the cell survives. And you know what X is. 
So we have a Department of Defense funded project on, on this in KGI, which is led by this guy, mm -hmm. and uh, with assistance from Payam, who is one of your friends, and Stephanie, who is here. <laughs> so now I go to those <laughs> who want to engineer genomes. So for example, we, we uh, talked about retroviruses such as HIV AIDS integrates into the genome and makes a provirus. Can you snip out the provirus from the cell? Well, I wouldn't be talking unless you could. So here is a, a uh, paper um, published uh, earlier this year, I forget what the date is, uh, earlier this year, which actually sh uh, were able to do that from human T lymphoid cells by simply making a guide RNA against the provirus and snipping it out. And you can go back, uh, look at the slides and find the references, or just Google and you can read about it. Uh, and before snipping, this is what the gene looked like, and after snipping, this is what the gene looks like. It takes out the entire uh, provirus genome between the two LTR elements, the long terminal repeat elements of retroviruses that are essential for integration, so those, uh, those ends are always there, but now you can snip out and take out the essential, the genes essential for viral replication. And I will show you another cute example of, of what you can do by engineering genomes. Cure malaria, how would you do that? Well, there are many ways by which you can do that. You can use mosquito nets, etc. but you know, that's tough. <laughs> uh, However, a new approach is coming over the horizon, and that is engineering mosquitoes to female sterility in a global way. How would you do that? I mean, there are billions, maybe hundreds of billions of mosquitoes, I don't know, hundreds, you know, once uh, uh, God has uh, inordinate fondness for insects, so, uh, <laughs> um, lots of mosquitoes. Uh, so there is something called gene drive, which instead of me explaining it, oops, instead of me explaining it, let somebody else explain it to you. What is a gene drive? A gene drive guarantees that a specific gene will be inherited. Gene yeah. drives are attached to the chosen gene and put into the organism. One gene can have different versions. Each organism gets two copies of each gene. Without a gene drive, when parents with different versions of a gene pass on their DNA, each version gets inherited by only half of the offspring. With a gene drive, when parents with different versions of a gene pass on their DNA, essentially all offspring will inherit the gene with the drive, generation after generation after generation. A gene drive contains instructions for a molecular tool that targets other versions of the chosen gene. The tool scans the organism's DNA and looks for other versions of the gene. Once it finds another version, the tool cuts it out. Left with a hole, the body uses the gene with the gene drive as a template to patch it up. The organism now has two copies to pass on to the next generation. So you know now what gene drive is, and this is how <coughs> people are using it. And now you know, uh, in our case, the gene drive is basically the CRISPR-Cas9, you can you guess that. And the driven mutant gene causes something, and that something is female-specific sterility. And everything else is normal, but the females are sterile. And as a result, when the females mate with the males, they can't lay eggs, so the, mo the mosquito population crashes mm -hmm. beyond a certain limit. So they did that, a gene driver has time against a particular, uh, mm, against a particular gene, and so they make a transgenic mosquito with one mutant gene, which has the CRISPR-Cas9 in it, encoded, and then whenever it mates, it actually spreads the mutant copy everywhere. And very soon, uh, most of the mosquitoes that are, that are generated will actually not be able to transmit uh, their progeny to the next generation. And the gene uh, mm, 
that, that was used was called AGAP007280, very imaginatively, which is essential for female fertility. And they targeted this, and this was still an experiment. They, they haven't done it in an environmental condition. But uh, they showed that instead of the 50% segregation uh, rate in a cage experiment of uh, using hundreds of mosquitoes, uh, they get uh, nearly 100% of the progeny very soon um, that have the, the driven gene. And in a cage experiment, starting with approximately 300 uh, of male and female, uh, starting with 50% uh, of, the, of the allele, very soon they're actually increasing to a very high number uh, over only four generations. And uh, over 10 generations, they're going to reach roughly 99%. It'll never be 100%, by the way. You can mathematically show that. Never be 100%, which is great for, for the environment. However, the population containing the parasite will be crashed to the extent that they no longer are threat to the human. <coughs> so what have we discussed so far? That this system is a simple, inexpensive tool. Any application that requires the gene or the genome uh, editing can potentially, any application can potentially use this tool. And we have talked about the uh, examples of the applications. And now we want to go to the nitty gritty to eliminate a gene or to replace the gene. That's what editing is about. <coughs> and you can also use it to control the expression of a gene, to turn on and off. And you can actually edit multiple genes at a time, which you couldn't do very easily with any of the earlier methods. So gene replacement is one in which you make a, a, a double-stranded DNA break on the genome uh, around the locus that you want to edit, either within or very close by. And then a gap <coughs> is produced, and you have added a piece of uh, DNA on by which you want to replace that, that white box, and then replacement occurs by dint of the cell's nucleus, its own enzymes that are always present. And I will not go into the details of those. However, the mechanism is actually very exciting, not for you perhaps, but for me. I, I had spent over 15 years uh, in various uh, capacities to figuring out how that actually happens. And then there is a second method called non-homologous end joining in which the DNA is simply cleaved just like that here. And you simply wait and a different classes of, uh, a, a, a different group of enzymes come and they simply sh shave off a little bit from the two ends and then put them together. And that is basically creating a mutation. This one creates a replacement. This one creates simply a mutation. So you need something that cleaves the DNA, also called DNA endonuclease, at a highly specific sequence. That's the magic bullet. It also implies that we know a code, code, a protein code, that recognizes a DNA sequence code. And that has been very, very difficult. So this uh, review by Kim, uh, which came up uh, last year, uh, yes, 2015 actually, uh, tells us a sort of a historical progression of the kind of stuff that we needed in order to come today to do genome editing with CRISPR-Cas9. And the first step was in 1982 when homologous recombination could be initiated and, and accomplished in the chromosome by making of a single, a single DNA double strand break on the chromosome, which apparently was, uh, according to the review article, was done by Rudin and Haber. Nora Rudin was a grad student of Haber. But uh, unfortunately, uh, some six months ago, we had published exactly the same thing. But <laughs> uh, so here, both of us use a naturally occurring zinc finger DNA and a nucleus. What is that? will come a little bit later. But it recognizes one single site in the genome and makes it double strand cleavage, and then things happen. And this is what this nucleus looked like. It has got little fingers uh, held together by zinc atoms. And each of these fingers is specific for, for about two and a half uh, bases. 
And there is a sort of a loose code between what amino acid sequence should occur in this protein zinc finger and which amino acid sequence would be responsible for binding what two and a half letter code. And it's not a perfect code. That is the problem. However, using the zinc finger, uh, very soon people started modifying uh, higher eukaryotic genomes. And uh, Holger Pucht, a friend of mine from Barbara Holmes lab in Switzerland, and uh, myself and my colleagues at that time, MIT and then ultimately from Rochester, we started using these zinc finger proteins to make uh, changes in the genome of the plant. And similarly, people started doing, uh, uh, a little bit later, starting from about 2002 to 2005, started making such changes in Drosophila as well as in, in human cells. So that, again, the restatement of the problem, the amino acid sequence of the zinc finger proteins rec must recognize the <coughs> DNA sequence. And it's, it's not a complete code. Not all DNA sequences could be targeted by zinc fingers. And new zinc finger nucleases are extremely difficult and expensive to make. There's a company, there are companies, uh, which used to make lots of zinc fingers for precisely this purpose and other purposes in late 90s and early 2000s. <coughs> so around 2009, and of course people were looking for alternatives, they cracked a code called tail code, T-A-L-E, tail code, in which the proteins can, uh, can be designed to virtually bind to any target sequence of your design. And that happens because this kind of protein has these fingers, which are much smaller, and has much better, you know, uh, much better geometric, uh, I, I would say, facility to bind single base at a time. And as a result, you can actually uh, combinatorially design a an array of <coughs> any of these tiny little fingers. These are not zinc fingers, but so-called tail fingers, transcription activator-like effector nucleases or tailings tail fingers and attach a DNA endonuclease uh, active site to it, in other words, engineer these proteins, and lo and behold, you have ready-made DNA breaking enzymes. Around 2009, uh, uh, around 2006, I believe they started, no, 2009, they started doing this. The problem with talons is that they're very expensive to make. So we immediately started using these talons to do genetic engineering in human cells in my laboratory, Mike, uh, used it uh, successfully to actually snip Huntington's disease gene uh, from, from uh, the donor locus, uh, and lots of people are doing it. However, it's very expensive, so $3,000 uh, for one talent pair to be made. And it's, uh, although it's possible, it's very difficult to justify talents as reagents for multiple gene targeting at, at the same time. And, and now, a different line of inquiry provided the breakthrough, as most often happens in science. And that is, how do bacteria protect themselves from invading viruses? And back in the 1960s, people discovered the restriction, actually from the late 50s, people discovered the restriction modification system, which have uh, uh, produced in bacteria a class of enzymes that have high specificity for a DNA sequence. In other words, the bacteria had broken the, the, um, the protein DNA interaction code and put endonuclease uh, domains naturally by natural evolution of these proteins, and we call them restriction endonucleases. And they cut the DNA. And those reagents gave rise to the first revolution in biotechnology. However, those enzymes generally recognized short DNA sequences. The maximum that anybody had ever found was about 15 or 16 nucleotide long. And that's not sufficient for achieving high accuracy for the kind of editing, genome editing that we're talking about. So the second clue came from the studies of adaptive immunity as opposed to the innate immunity equivalence in bacteria. In other words, some bacterial cells acquire immunity against uh, invading bacteria, which had invaded the population in the past, uh, uh, invading viruses, which had invaded the bacterial population in the past. 
And I will uh, cut a long story short. Uh, so this was first uh, reported back in 1989. And they found by simply sequencing, uh, by chance, sequencing regions nearby a gene required for biosynthesis of, of uh, tryptophan, they found an unusual repeat structure in which there is an 80 rich leader sequence followed by a series of about 23 to 50 nucleotide repeats, and there is a spacer in between them. And the spacers are variable, but the repeats are constant. And then a series of genes which didn't mean anything to anybody at that time. And subsequently, people kept uh, looking and looking to see what they mean. And around 2002 to 2006, computational biologists, uh, um, by doing computational analysis, realized that they, they included spacer sequences. The spacer sequences, which are variable, are actually homologous to short regions of viruses that exist in the populations of those bacteria. And second, they found that these genes encode proteins that most likely are DNA endonuclease like proteins, although they didn't know uh, for sure that's what they thought. And immediately molecular biologists jumped onto those, those uh, inferences and, and a series of experiments uh, gave rise to this idea that invading viral DNA are sometimes accidentally, which fail to kill the host occasionally, their DNA is chopped up into pieces and are incorporated into these tiny repeat elements. And then the leader, uh, there's a promoter right next to the leader sequences, which make RNA, polycystronic RNA, of these little chopped up sequences. And this RNA are processed by a series of genes uh, that are the so-called Cas genes, uh, that are RNA and DNA endonucleases. And these guide RNAs then bind to any subsequent viral, invading viral DNA. And this guide RNA bring about chopping of the viral genome. That's a form of uh, acquired immunity or adaptive immunity. So this is what happens, a, a, a series of uh, pre-CRISPR uh, RNA, which is processed into mature CRISPR RNA, which then does its job. Immediately, molecular biologists jumped onto this and actually reconstituted this in vitro, which is essential for doing molecular biology with it to be used as a reagent. And within a year, people started using it to engineer genomes in 2013. Uh, the first paper by a series of four groups uh, were published that showed that indeed you can use the system to engineer human genome and recall how it was discovered. It was a pure accidental discovery on something very, very uh, modest and pedestrian uh, work. Now the CRISPR protein has two sites, here and there. And the guide RNA, this is the guide RNA, should be about 23 to 25 nucleotide long. And near the target, there has to be one restriction. There has to be something called PAM site, which you just heard in the, feed, in the first video, so-called PAM site. And this PAM site depends on the source of your Cas9 enzyme, which microbe did you clone it uh, from. But the PAM site is usually very tiny and is very probable for two nucleotides to occur adjacently, two TTs, at a very high rate. You can calculate how, uh, uh, how frequently. But these TTs are almost invariably found near any target region that you want to target. And uh, we also immediately jumped under the uh, bandwagon. And Mike is here, Biranchi, my postdoc, uh, uh, who used to be here. We published a paper along with Lisa Ellerby on using this to snip out uh, Huntington's disease gene in mutant uh, patient derived cells. The crystal structure of the guide RNA <coughs> bound to the Cas9 uh, protein has been solved along with the target binding. So here is the DNA, and here is the guide RNA. And the guide RNA has bound to the DNA in the, in the, in the, in the environment of a complex protein. So let's see if we can have some fun here. Uh, 
Yes. So you can actually rotate this, and you can see that this is a target DNA. This is a guide RNA. And this is the rest of the protein. And you can sort of move it to play with this. And the reason uh, I'm showing you this is because it allows <coughs> us to play with it molecularly as well and make all different kinds of reagents for the kind of different engineering applications that you have. And I'll come to those slowly. Uh, here is uh, a, a um, snapshot of the structures that were determined in uh, Jennifer Doudna's laboratory at UC Berkeley, which actually showed that during the process of the protein uh, binding to the ternary complex of DNA, guide RNA, and itself, and cleavage and release, the protein undergoes an acrobatics of sort in which different domains the proteins actually move around. Back in the late 2000s, before knowing all of these things, we had actually started working on developing an enzyme of this sort in which we would take the zinc fingers of a protein that we designed, uh, attach a single-stranded DNA binding domain and a nuclease domain and would basically do exactly the same thing. Thank heavens we didn't do it because it wouldn't have worked. And the reason it wouldn't have worked is because of this complex dynamics of the protein that is required to, undergo, uh, to, to accomplish the stuff. It is not a passive case of something grabbing onto something, something grabbing onto another thing, and something cleaving. It's not that. It's much more complex. It requires a uh, dynamical shape change of the protein to actually unwind the target DNA a little bit using an enzyme called ROPC then uh, taking the guide RNA at the bound locus and actually making a, a hybrid of DNA and RNA that's enzymatically uh, done, and so on. So we were very simplistic back in the early 2000s. Uh, and, and NSF didn't fund us, probably because of that, but uh, whatever. But we wouldn't have <laughs> succeeded had we, had we tried this. The reality solved by natural selection is a lot more interesting than what human beings can think just by doing engineering. Now, if the guide RNA has a few base pairs of mismatches with the target, Cas9 still works. See here? This is the red guide RNA. This base is actually not paired to that particular DNA base. There is a mismatch. And yet, Cas9 thieves. So you don't want that. You want a perfect cleavage at the target site that you choose. In other words, the ratio of on-target to off-target cleavages should be very high, at the ideally infinity, but no, never so. So the question is how high a ratio is just acceptable for gene therapy applications, or rather how, how low a ratio of such can you tolerate for gene therapy application using human beings. And can specificity be improved? Well, they came up with one, uh, one tool for doing that. What they did is simply to remove one of the active sites that cleaves the other DNA strand, but keep one of the DNA strand cleavage activity intact by making a simple mutation. And then <coughs> they used two different half guide RNAs. And each is about 17 to 18 nucleotide long, which imposes stringent, stringent requirement for base pairing on the guide RNA DNA homology. With longer guide RNA sequence, you can by mistake hybridize to other things. But with shorter guide RNA sequence, you require very strong stability by hybrid bonding and stacking of the bases to actually uh, bind to off-target places. So that's minimized by the two uh, guide RNA is being short, but right next to each other, with some rules as to how far apart. And then if you add, uh, and the guide RNAs are uh, so designed that they are complementary to opposite DNA strands. So now, you require two K9 
cast ions, each of which nicks at the two strands. And because the distance between these two sites is chosen so that the hydrogen bonded region of the DNA in between the two nicked strands, the opposite uh, strands, is low enough so that the two ends of the DNA fall apart. There's a question. Oh, yeah. I just had a question because I, I was wondering if this 17 to 18, that's shorter than it was 23 or 25, or but maybe that was something else. Correct. 23 to 25 is the real sequence that, oh, yeah. that the equally normally uses, but people have now resorted, uh, resorted to 17 to 18. Yes. We, we, we got it right. So if the off-target off probability of cleavage at off-target is p, then the probability of cleavage uh, mm, using this technique is p squared, much smaller. And also the guide RNA shortening improves uh, the accuracy. So the subsequent advances were there were 190,000 guide RNA sequences targeting about 40% of all protein coding genes in the human genome were uh, computationally made. So people went through the human genome sequence uh, devising a program that would select for guide RNA sequences uh, targeting each of these human genes. And these guide RNAs were synthesized on, uh, in a high throughput manner. And we can now buy this guide RNA. We have purchased this guide RNA uh, for, for <coughs> you know, now, now more than that, about, about uh, well, I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, then guide RNAs 90%, corresponding to 90% of all mouse protein coding genes were made similarly. And more, 70,000 guide RNA sequences targeting <coughs> regulatory sequences of genes, that is the promoter enhancer elements of genes, have been made, corresponding to 75% of all protein coding genes. And we purchased this for only about $450. Unimaginable. And now, you can further hack the cast time protein <laughs> to do other things. <coughs> so hack one, transcriptional repressor. All you do is block both of those cleavage sites by mutation. And then this protein loses its dynamic ability to actually not bind the DNA, not bind the guide RNA, but to cleave and then be released. This cleavage and release is a result of the energy that is released because of the phosphodiester bond breakage of the two sites and subsequent release due to the dynamic uh, change in the protein conformation. You block that by stopping the cleavage. And as a result, the protein stays glued onto its target site. And no RNA polymerase can bind and start transcription. So you've just made a transcriptional <coughs> repressor. So using this switch, you can turn on or off gene, any gene that you like, depending on what guide RNA you choose. Or you can make it an activator by actually clipping off uh, the cleavage sites, but in addition, putting an RNA polymerase contact protein, contacting protein, activation domain, so-called, transcriptional activation domain. And that actually enables the RNA polymerase to actually bind here and, trans and start transcription if there's a promoter there. So you can turn on, at will, any gene that you like in the human genome simply by choosing from your library one of these guide RNAs. And as I said, we have 70,000 guide RNAs corresponding to 20,000 genes that Stephanie and Mike and Payam are using to turn on genes in the human genome to look for genes that impart resistance to the drug. Uh, cancer killing drug. And these guide RNAs are made in a high throughput manner on little plates, and as a result, they are so cheap. You can play epigenetic engineering as well. You can put onto the uh, Cas9, defective Cas9 protein that cannot cleave anymore, something that modulates the epigenetic gene expression, such as. Uh, DNA macular transferases or histone acetylases, you name it, and people have started doing this already. Here. In addition, you can make this switchable. You can make a cell that makes this modified switch protein of Cas4, Cas9, and then depending on whether or not you want to expose the cell to a chemical, 
you can switch on the activity of the gene expression, repression or silence, uh, repression or activation, by simply adding a domain to the protein that is sensitive to small molecules. And that has been done. In fact, what has been done is a multidimensional chemical switch in which there are multiple domains attached to the Casper crystalline. And so the cell's behavior in terms of gene switch on, in, on and on is actually modulatable by a series of chemicals simultaneously in mixtures or single. And they generated, and our group generated, a logical gate in which the expression of two genes that are important for cancer production or not could be integrated by this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene activation, gene repression system. And given whether the cell is a cancer cell or whether it's a normal cell, this logic gate is going to do two different things. If it's a cancer cell, it's going to undergo cell death or apoptosis. If it's a normal cell, it's going to survive. And they did that, and I will, I will go th not go through the actual making of how it did, but go through the result, in which they looked at two, they hooked it to the end of this circuit to two genes, BAX and BCL2, both of which are involved in programmed cell death. When BAX to BCL2 expression is much less than one, or at least uh, uh, you know, it's, it's less than or equal to one, cells don't die. If the ratio is higher, the cell dies. And in fact, depending on whether it's a cancer cell, a hepatocarcinoma cell, or a normal liver cell, the ratios could be manipulated. Here is VAX, here is BCL2, here is VAX and BCL2 side by side, and the ratio is a lot higher here than here. So these cancer cells were done. as of yesterday, uh, we have the news that the first person to receive a CRISPR-Cas9 gene edit editing uh, is still alive and is doing well in China. Uh, uh, the person has a non-small cell lung cancer for which no treatment exists. So they target a protein called PDC1, or uh, actually the news item says PD1, but that's an absolute uh, mm, uh, designation of the gene, <coughs> PDCD1. The protein is normally expressed in pro B cells, which slows down the immune response. People had shown earlier that you can take antibodies <coughs> against uh, against the PDCD1 protein, which is expressed on, on the outside, and kill these cells. Then you can actually make these patients uh, survive a little bit longer than normal. So it's an ideal condition. So they chose, uh, I, I, they don't say exactly what immune cell, but I hope they, they probably, uh, I think they probably chose the pro B cells and then snipped out the PDCD1 gene out of that and then cultivated them uh, in vitro and put them back in on 28th of October 2016. And so far, the patient is doing well. For the next few months, they can monitor the patient to see if there's no adverse effect then the patient is going to get a subsequent injection into the blood of, of the same um, genetically engineered cells, and hopefully we see something better. In summary, you know that this is a modular system for genome editing because you can do, you can hack it, and you couldn't have hacked it unless it's modular. It's inexpensive, specific. It can be used to turn on and off genes at will a whole genome scale, and it's up to your imagination to actually apply it to various opportunities that would come in the future. And let me take this opportunity to underline this. The key to important progress in biotechnology is curiosity-driven research. Without this, we will never go anywhere. And therefore, pay your tax. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. So uh, there, there are two competing patents, uh, one from Jennifer Dubner's lab at UC Berkeley, the other from <coughs> uh, Feng Jam's lab from MIT. And uh, 
you know, they're going to fight it out, but the scientists are not at all interested because they see that this uh, would be modified, engineered, bypassed uh, to the extent that their patent positions probably cannot protect. But the institutions would lose money uh, if something is not granted, so they'll fight it out. Who knows? But um, neither research nor commercial applications stop for that. So there are uh, lots of satellite companies, uh, startup companies that come up that actually are um, selling reagents based on modifications of these uh, Cas9, etc. Uh, selling guide RNAs for uh, customizing your um, you know, app particular application, um, uh, helping you actually do this. You know all of these things. So there are. I mean, I, I looked a few weeks ago, and there were at least uh, 25, 30 <laughs> such companies in the USA. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's stopping, and then clinical trials going on. You know, this this is going to explode like this. Uh, I mean, I, I think it will it will be a hype if I say it will be a second revolution in biotechnology, but it's close. And who knows? Some, something might come up that's really new again and much better. Who knows? But this is as good as it gets. Yeah. In your research with your colleagues, do you guys specifically targeted Huntington's disease? I just want to know why. Uh, uh, the, the one that was published? Yes. Yes. So why specifically Huntington's versus another? Because, uh, very simple, because we found an opportunity for getting money to do that from <laughs> Huntington's disease <laughs> information. <laughs> and that's okay. You go with the money list in order to be able to do these things. And it's an important problem, but that's why we're okay. Yes. What, what ethical considerations are taking place in the scientific community? So uh, the regulatory bodies have actually approved uh, um, international regulatory bodies have actually proved the first clinical trial in China. China plans, I think, three or four additional clinical trials, but they have not yet been approved. In America, I think there is one or maybe two that are still waiting for approval. Uh, the ethical considerations obviously are, you know, number one, do no harm, and, and must you do it. So in this particular case in China, uh, the person has no other you know, uh, opportunities, no, no, no other ways for the to be cured. Uh, and, and the guy <coughs> probably, I mean, well, woman, I, uh, may die in a few, few months on, on the street. So that's a great uh, way. But then the fear is, would he or she die sooner because of this? Right? Uh, there is no other ethical consideration I can think of for that particular application. Mm -hmm. But then there could be many other applications that you could think of. Designer babies. Uh, it, 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 it makes me very apprehensive and afraid if something like this happens. But I do not personally believe, and I may be wrong, I'm almost always wrong when I make these predictions. <laughs> uh, uh, I do not believe that um, it's possible to actually go into designer baby path. In the next, uh, I used to say 20, but now maybe I should say 15 uh, years. And the reason is that most of the so-called designer traits that people desire are all multigenic, quantitative loci traits. They're not like hereditary <coughs> disorders. The hereditary disorders that can be cured in utero or before utero, before uh, in vitro fertilization, I do not make classify them as design babies. Okay. They are diseases waiting to happen. So if you can cure this, right. But designer babies in which you uh, shop and funds for a baby of uh, you know whatever eye color and whatever height and, and uh, muscle quality, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult. I mean, there, there are no rational ways by which you could actually engineer those because the, the, the fundamental science of these qualities is lacking. Is there an issue with germ cell? Um, uh, so uh, the issue for the uh, germ cell is if you want to do this with embryonic stem cells, for example, then in certain states you have a problem, in other states you don't have a problem. So it's not a universal problem. And people, people are coming to accept it. It's not, not a real issue ultimately. I mean, when the dust settles, things will be better. Uh, would there be any tra <coughs> transgenerational implications when you're applying this type of treatment? Right. But absolutely, absolutely there would be transgenerational implications. For example, uh, there, are, there are communities, um, Ashkenazi uh, 
Jewish population, for example. Uh, they, because of, in the past, because of inbreeding, they have uh, developed, uh, because of you know, standard human genetics uh, uh, principles, accumulated certain higher frequency of the yield that give rise to um, certain genetic disorders. Now, if you keep correcting them, then very soon you may balance out. Uh, so, so two things. One is that certain alleles that would have been eliminated in the past now are maintained because of better uh, care. That's a major global problem. Because imagine that there is a there is global warming or or uh, you know sudden sudden meteor strike and there is cooling, super cooling, global cooling, or a nuclear winter. Something happens back. And let's say that it affects about 30% of the world population. People who are going to most frequently die are those that are genetically so, you know, depressed. We now have all kinds of uh, postnatal and adult care system to actually keep these people alive. If that happens, a, a, a large proportion of such people will die. So one way you could think of is use this prenatally by IVF uh, fertilization to actually snip out those genes and replace with the wild type ones. And then you, you circumvent such global you know, population crash of certain individuals, of, of certain communities. That's possible. I don't know if it's ethical, but that's something out of, out of my hip pocket right now mm -hmm. that I offer in response to the question. <laughs> Would we, would we be able to detect those? Uh, let's say something goes wrong when you insert something. Would you be right. able to detect? Right. Yes. It? So, so something goes wrong. Um, one of the things that could go wrong is some mutation elsewhere, off target. Yes. So it is feasible, but I don't believe that they're done. But uh, I may be wrong. I haven't seen the paper. Right? It's not in the middle. Um, but it is feasible to actually cultivate the targeted site uh, cells in vitro, which they've done, then take some uh, um, you know, aliquot out, inject the remainder, and then deep sequence this to find out every nucleotide of the person, or of the person's cells, right? Now, if they did it beforehand, and then picked somehow those cells, clonal cells that did not have any other mutation except the one that is necessary, it's feasible, but very time consuming and probably expensive. And then chose those cells, or you know, progeny of those cells, the clones of those cells, and injected. Yes. So yes, it is possible to detect. detect. Yes, it is possible to uh, circumvent. But maybe time, and time is an issue. Yes. Is the restriction in the nuclease market just plummeted? No. Will it go oh. away? No, it's not going to go away. Because uh, because. They have a different, different application area that uh, CRISPR does not uh, compete with. Uh, in vitro DNA cleavage and analysis on gels. CRISPR, in vitro CRISPR reaction is damn tough. You don't want to go, in, mm. go into that. Mm. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you get your funding from DOD? Yes. Yeah. So are they looking for any kind of applications beyond just basic? No, they they have a lot of veterans. I mean, the, the justification goes like this: there are a lot of veterans who suffer from lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So they want to help, them. but the real reason is different. Congress, Republican Congress, for the last few years, have been tightening NIH and NSF funding, and a lot of um, research needs to be done. So the Department of Defense basically came forward and are using a separate um, st uh, stash of money that the US government has to actually support some research. Good. Well, thank you very much for this. <laughs> Another event brought to you by alumni and data. Keep coming back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.